Watching the world burn, watching the world burn, October 27th, 2023, let's get into it. You know, I, I hate to hit on the Israeli conflict because that's all everybody talks about. Uh, and we're going to get into other topics in this video, but uh, I wanted to start with a video from uh, Dave Rubin. It was from the Rubin Report, and he had Bridget on there, and I... Uh, I want to give you the background. Of course, I can't play you the whole video. They'd be stealing all of his material. But uh, she was in Lebanon and uh, back in the 80s. Remember the um, when the Marine Corps barracks was blown up there under the Reagan administration? And uh, she described what took place. They lit up, um, well, I think one million Palestinians into Lebanon. And it was back then, Lebanon was a Christian country. And uh, the Palestinians uh, basically came in and, and waged war on the Christians. And, uh, and of course, Lebanon, as a result, was uh, pretty much destroyed. <laughs> and she, uh, she lived in a bunker for like, oh, my God, I think she said seven years in the video. I won't go watch it on the Rubin Report. Definitely check it out. But she expresses the sentiment that, uh, that she feels uh, towards the Palestinians. And uh, it's pretty, um, pretty intense. Uh, she just feels they need to be exterminated, uh, that they're a plague upon the world and, uh, and you know, don't let them into your country. And she's fighting uh, like hell not to let them into the United States. Uh, she said because they hate all Christians and they hate uh, uh, all Jews. Uh, and, and she basically says that all the Palestinians feel this way. And that's how they're raised uh, from a young age. And I... Uh, it, this could be a good reason why they're not allowed into other countries. I always tr try to present both sides of the story. You know, I will let, let, I'll just let you listen to her. Uh, th this is I'm, I had to I had to cut this up as best I could, and and let's just listen to that. That's exactly why I wanted to have you on the show this week. Uh, so I want to do a little recap. You, you've told the story many times. You've written about it and everything else. But I thought we could just do a few minutes on your childhood growing up in Lebanon and sort of what led you to being the person that you are now. We'll just recap that briefly. And then I want to talk to you about the current events. But your personal story, it's just so absolutely incredible and so relevant to, to everything that's happening in the world right now. Exactly, especially as we watch what's happening uh, between Lebanon and Israel and Gaza. You know, I was born and raised in Lebanon. Uh, Lebanon used to be the only majority Christian country in the Middle East. Most people don't know that. We were fair-minded, we were open-minded, we were tolerant, we were multicultural. We prided ourselves on our multiculturalism. We welcomed everyone into our country, including Palestinians, uh, because we wanted to share with them the westernization which we had created in the heart of the Middle East. Unfortunately, David, we took people into our country who did not share our values. My 9-11 happened to me in 1975 when actually Palestinian radical Islamists blew up my home, bringing it down, burying me under the rubble wounded as they were trying to take over our town. I ended up in the hospital for two and a half months and later ended up living in a bomb shelter in an eight by 10 room bomb shelter without water, without very little food and no electricity. And that's where I lived lived for the next seven years of my life robbed of my youth. So I understand I'm not only a terrorism analyst who studied about terrorism in college. I'm an eyewitness to terror who lived to tell about it. And that's why I speak so forcefully and so passionately about standing up to those who want to perpetrate evil. If we could people don't stand up and speak out, who else is going to do it? Except the kidnapping of six-month-old children or two-year-old little girls or the rape of teenage girls or the torture and rape and humiliation of grandmothers. Where are the Palestinian voices speaking up right now? If you were, if you were in Israel or you were an Israeli citizen or you were advising Israel, what, what would you be telling them to do right now? Because it's not just the 1,300 people that are dead. It's the 200 hostages. It's the fact that 7,000 rockets have been shot since this began and are still being shot at this very moment. What, what would you tell them to do in the face of what you're describing? Look, war is ugly. 
but the only way you're going to fight a war is to win it. They have to win. And yes, in war, innocent people die. That's a part of the collateral damage of war. And I am the last person in the world who advocates for war. I'm a survivor of war. Mm -hmm. But I understand that if you are fighting a disease like cancer, you've got to root cancer out. Because if you don't, cancer is going to kill you. It's not an if. It's a, it's a matter of when. It's not a question. And right now in the Middle East, if we want to prosper in the Middle East, if we want to see a prosperous and peaceful Lebanon, a prosperous and peaceful Palestinian territories, a prosperous and peaceful Jordan, you have to take out evil starting with Iran. Iran is funding both Hezbollah and Hamas, and they've got to take them out. Have no mercy. Go out and take them out. Does it sort of seem to you like a lot of the Arab countries, they need Israel in a way like they kind of need it because it's the scapegoat for all of the bad things that they do to their own citizens? I mean, in Lebanon, as you described, Palestinians can't vote. There's, I think, 20 or 30 things. They're not allowed to be lawyers or doctors. There's like a series of things. Same in Jordan. Like they sort of need Israel to be like, ah, well, we're doing some bad stuff to you. But eh, the Jews over there. Well, look, the Arabs need the Palestinians, but at this point, the Arabs are prospering. They are growing. And the Palestinians, everywhere they go, they cause a problem. That's the problem. That's why Egypt doesn't want them. You know, I mean, that's why they said, no way. All they have to do is look at what the Palestinians did in Jordan and what the Palestinians did in Lebanon. They destroyed Lebanon. King Hussein of Jordan bulldozed 30,000 mm -hmm. of them back in 1974-75 and kicked them out. His own wife is a Palestinian and he doesn't want to take any more Palestinians. They are a problem anywhere they go, and that's why they do not want them. But here's the other thing. Look, there are many Palestinians living in America. There are many Palestinians living in Australia. There are many Palestinians living all over the world. They have whatever right they want. Look at Rashida Tlaib, a member of Congress elected in, in the United States of America. You know, why are they still screaming about, oh, four generations ago, we used to have a home? What about all the Israelis, that, all the Jews that were kicked out of Arab land? Over one million Jews were kicked out of Egypt, out of Iran, out of Lebanon, out of Jordan, out of Syria. They're not complaining we want to go back. They said, okay, we were kicked out. We'll start a new life somewhere else. Just like I started the new life in America. Mm -hmm. you know, we need to move forward with the times and they need to get over holding a grudge and moving over so everybody can live in peace. And by the way, uh, Dave, one important thing. Uh, Ehud Barak in 2000 offered them 97% of yeah. the territories. 97%. They did not want it. They didn't want it. They wanted all of Israel because they want to kick the Israelis out. And most people don't remember. In 1964, when the PLO was founded, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, is Gaza was Egypt and the West Bank was Jordan. Yep. The PLO was founded to eradicate the Jews and annihilate them and kick them into the sea. A Jordanian flag was flying over Gaza. They didn't call it occupied territories then. Mm -hmm. a, 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 a Egyptian flag was flying over Gaza and a Jordanian flag was flying over the West Bank. How come they were not screaming about occupation then? What the Palestinians want is basically to eliminate the existence of Israel out of the Middle East, period. I'm so glad you mentioned that because one of the things I've really been trying to do for the last two weeks is tell people basic history. And, you know, there's this whole thing now where people are saying, well, there's been an occupation for 75 years. And it's bizarre to me that people seem to be calling for the British Empire to return. Right. I mean, that's what, in essence, you'd be asking for, because there never was a Palestinian state. That's right. That's right. There was never a Palestinian state. Even Jews who lived in that region were Palestinians. Look, Jerusalem was desolate land. I mean, they didn't care of it. Have you seen picture? People need to Google pictures of Jerusalem back 100 years ago, 150 years ago. I mean, it was nothing. And, you know, Israel, the Israel accepted whatever the UN gave them. And actually, the reason why Israel is on the coast with the sand dunes, that's what the UN gave Israel. The Arabs said, OK, fine, give them that. You know, they're going to die. You can't grow anything. You know, it's desolate land. The Jews turned the desert into an oasis. They turned it into Eden. And then in 1967, the Arabs attacked the Jews. That's how, you know, Israel ended up. Uh, with Jerusalem. This is how they ended up. And look at the Yom Kippur War. Israel gained more land every time the Arabs attacked Israel. And finally, you know, Israel doesn't want the land. They gave the land to Gaza for those who are saying occupation. Israel withdrew out of Gaza in 2005. Mm -hmm. And those of, a lot of us did not want Israel to withdraw out of Gaza. 
Israel dragged their own citizens out of Gaza, literally dragged them yeah. kicking and screaming. And, you know, because they wanted to give all of Gaza to the Palestinians. Here it is. It is yours. You build it. They left all the greenhouses. The greenhouses, you, Gaza used to export 50 million flowers a year, just flowers out of the Gaza Strip, not to mention tomatoes, vegetables, uh, fruits. Uh, they used to export all over the world. The Israelis left all the greenhouses behind. I know an Israeli, a Jewish businessman in New York, a very lefty Jewish businessman, <laughs> gave the Palestinians $14 million so they can start with the base money, so they can continue running the greenhouses, so they can flourish and grow their economy and hire people. And what did the Palestinians do in Gaza? Within 24 hours, they burned 126 synagogues, destroyed the greenhouses, even dismantled the, the pipes. So they stole the copper out of the pipes. They destroyed them. These people shoot themselves in the foot. They could have turned Gaza into Singapore, yeah. but they didn't. It's not the fault of Israel. It's the fault of Hamas and the Palestinians. Do you think the West as a whole has the, the stomach or the fortitude or do we even have enough sort of cultural energy to, to win this thing? I don't, I don't mean the specifics of this war, but what seems to now be brewing across a, a, all of the globe where we're seeing these crazy uh, protests in London and in Paris and in Sydney, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think the West has enough left to, to fight for all the good ideas that your life is an example of? Yes, the West will have the resolve if they have a good leader. Look, under President Donald Trump, you didn't see anything happening like this across the world. Zip! Four years, nothing, no, no wars. You know why? Putin feared him, Russia feared him, Iran feared him, China feared him. They didn't know what, was it, what he was going to do. And when you have a leader who is so strong, he inspires other leaders to be strong. And so this is how you see the creme rising to the top. And as soon as President Trump was no longer at the White House, the whole world fell apart. This is not a wasted lesson on our enemies. China, Iran, North Korea, uh, um, um, Russia realized under Biden, they've got a four year window of opportunity. And especially after the withdrawal that we did out of Afghanistan. And this is exactly why China sent their ships surrounding Taiwan. Russia invaded Ukraine. Iran now is prodding and poking at Israel. They realized now they've got one year to do whatever they wanna do. And this is why we must organize. We must come together. And I urge people to go to my website actforamerica.org, actforamerica.org. We are now 2 million members mobilizing nationwide. We helped pass 210 bills on the federal level and the state level to protect the country. Right now we have a petition on the website to stop the importation of any Palestinian refugee into America. You need to take action on that petition right now because once the ground invasion starts in Gaza, watch the Democrats in our country start mm -hmm. screaming, oh my gosh, we've got to help the Palestinian. Now is the time to speak up and put pressure on your elected officials so they can understand that the American public is united. We're not going to import Palestinian terrorists into our country. Go to actforamerica.org or right now sign that petition as well as the action campaign we have to expel Rashida Tlaib from Congress. All right, we're going to link to that as well. You're going to set a record for the amount of links that we're going to put in one show. And uh, Brigitte, I'm going to leave you with a chance to make me cry again. Tell, tell me all about freedom one more time. So wasn't that interesting? Uh, and so that gives you a different perspective from the Israeli side, because uh, I've been basically presenting the uh, Palestinian side in that, you know, I don't believe in the extermination of civilians. Uh, but of course, when you listen to her, she says that all civilians are in on it, that they all, all Palestinians are, are evil and, and will destroy, they're like a locust on the planet and they will destroy whatever they come in contact with, including the, the farms that the Israelis left behind in Gaza. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the first video. Uh, let's move around the world here just a little bit. Uh, still staying on the uh, Persian Gulf to a certain extent. Uh, we do know that the Chinese have dispatched, I think it's just six ships, uh, towards the Persian Gulf. Um, so we'll see, uh, you know, but I mean, that is something that they're, they're tweaking the nose of the United States. And also we've got the Chinese ambassador uh, here in the United States, Wang, Wang, Wang He. 
He's in the United States talking to Lincoln, Blinken, won't you look me in the eye? Remember that song about Afghanistan? He was responsible for that pullout. Just, just want to remind you about that. Uh, the fiasco that took place in Afghanistan that basically condemned the whole world to hate or look at the United States as the weak, crippled people that we are under the Biden administration. Uh, so anyway, but this was an interesting video. This came from Judge Napolitano. And uh, this, well, it's ABC News, and the, the uh, Chinese just flew really close to a B-52 bomber. Now, what the hell have we got B-52 bombers flying next to um, China for? Uh, if they're in international waters, okay, I understand that. Imagine if they were uh, Chinese bombers were off the coast of uh, California or off the coast of Florida. I don't think we'd take too kindly to that. And so the Chinese, uh, they dispatched a fighter, and uh, he came within, I don't know, it was like, 10 feet or something? <laughs> Let's watch the video. It's a, an ABC News report by my friend Terry Moran. Well, we started together at uh, Court TV. It seems like 100 years ago. But anyway, Terry is narrating an ABC News report on the Chinese jets coming very close to a B-52 bomber. In a minute, Larry, what was a B-52 bomber doing there? But this is harrowing what you're about to watch. In the dead of night over the South China Sea, a Chinese fighter jet came within just 10 feet of an American B-52 bomber, an encounter so dangerous the Pentagon says that it seems the Chinese pilot was unaware of how close he came to causing a collision. What should have been a fairly routine intercept got way too close and more dangerous than it needed to be. Just last week, the Pentagon declassified several videos and photos of what U.S. officials called coercive and risky behavior by Chinese pilots in the last year and a half. U.S. officials warn China is increasingly trying to intimidate U.S. aircraft flying over international waters, while China's defense ministry blames the U.S. for flying over territory it considers its own. The risks of an accidental collision are even greater now, with China rebuffing U.S. attempts to restart a military hotline. The latest incident comes as China's top diplomat, Wang Yi, is in Washington this week, meeting President Biden's top advisors as they try to stabilize U.S.-China relations. Wasn't that interesting? Wasn't that interesting? I think China's trying to send a clear signal. You know what? We're done with you uh, United States fools trying to bully against us. So now we're starting the, the warmongering Democrats. The warmongering Democrats are trying to start a war in China. Uh, we, we've dispatched, uh, that. while well, getting back to the Middle East for just two seconds, is we've dispatched four carrier groups, four carrier groups to the, to the Middle East. Uh, you want to talk about some firepower, uh, which is utterly ridiculous, uh, unless you're going on an offensive operation. And also we're offloading a lot of munitions un, into our, our bases in the Middle East, uh, mainly in Iran and Syria. And then, of course, American jets just hit targets in Syria. I mean, it seems like the Biden administration wants to wage war on the entire world. You know, we're flying B-52 bombers off the coast of China. Okay, let's fight China. Let's, uh, let's dispatch four carrier groups to the Middle East. We, let's fight all of the Middle East. We're going to fight Iran. Well, by the way, I, I'm predicting now, I'm predicting that we will definitely be at war with Iran within the next couple of months. No doubt about it. This is what they want. This is what the neocons want. Uh, you don't position this much military hardware in the Middle East. What about taking care of the United States, don't you think? And that, that's another thing is the Nigerians are telling the, uh, the, the Americans they want the U.S. troops out of Nigeria. And yet, you know, and, and Rand Paul is saying, let's bring our youth home and protect the United States. These neocon lunatic Democrat lunatic, that warmongering Democrats don't give a crap about the United States. All they care about is fighting wars all around the world. Do you understand that? How in the hell do the American people vote for these people? I don't even get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, so that was the next video. Let's see. Uh, we got the Chinese fighter. We got the. Uh, we've definitely lost track of the war in Ukraine. Let's watch a little bit of Russian hardware.
so that's uh, that's a little bit of Russian hardware going on over there. Well, and then if we do go to war in the Middle East, you understand that oil prices are going to skyrocket. So all you, um, and I identify as one, all of us rednecks uh, with pickup trucks. I don't have a pickup truck, by the way, but I mean, I used to. And uh, oil prices are going to skyrocket. How in the hell are you going to be able to drive your pickup truck around getting, what, 20 miles to the gallon when oil prices... And this is, I mean, I, if, if we go to war in the Middle East, you could see $10 a gallon. How the hell are you going to afford that? You know, I, I don't know. I'm just telling you, I get you, a, a, I have a Honda ADV 150, uh, gets 100 miles to the gallon, uh, just so that I can get back and forth. Uh, and of course, how are you going to get groceries? At $10 a gallon, your grocery stores are going to be empty because all the trucking companies can't afford to deliver anything. Oh, my God, the warmongering Democrats, they're lunatics. They're all lunatics. I'm telling you, this is insane. So uh, I guess that's about it. Let's, uh, let's watch another Russian hardware video because we got to keep an eye on Ukraine, right? I guess the only good news I've got in all of this was uh, Mike Johnson. He's the new speaker. I like him a lot. I think he's great. And I want to finish off because I'm going to start adding these in. Uh, anytime I talk about the jab, I get uh, uh, a strike on uh, YouTube. I'm not talking about it. This is Dr. John Campbell. He's got a heck of a following on YouTube. I encourage you to watch this latest video. I'm just going to play a couple seconds for you. Uh, because it was a woman that uh, went in and she talked about the jab before um, an empty house uh, there in, in, in Great Britain. It was a, it's probably the greatest video about the jab I've ever seen. Peace out. Stay free. Now, this was in the English House of Commons. It was put forward by Sir Christopher Chope, a Conservative Member of Parliament. Now, this debate was attended by three Labour MPs, no Liberal Democrat MPs, no Scottish nationalist MPs and uh, eight or nine conservative uh, MPs. Quite a, an abysmal turnout for such an important topic. But she talks about safe and effective. What do these words mean? And this is part of the problem. It, it, it is the corruption of the very language that we use to try and describe things that's used to change meaning. She talks about questions that really weren't allowed to be asked and talks about not the progress of science, but there's the science. You lot sit down there, take notes, I'll tell you what the science is. Don't think for yourself. And abusive terms like covid yet anti-vaxxers. And we really do need an open debate, but she puts it so well. But do just give her this, uh, I think it's about 10 minutes, give her the time. And um, I know it alleviated a lot of the frustrations I've been feeling. So uh, over to Esther McVeigh, thank you. And at the tail end of his speech, he talked about the phrase safe and effective. And I'd like to pick up on that phrase and start my speech from there. A phrase, safe and effective, that became the COVID vaccine catchphrase, we'll call it that, that was repeated so many times over the last couple of years, it cropped up everywhere in government communications, in interviews with experts, and across a media to only too happy to run with that COVID slogan, safe and effective. So ingrained did that become in the national psyche that to ever then ask questions about 
the COVID vaccine became very difficult to do indeed. And asking questions is a vital part of scientific and indeed political debate. However, when discussing COVID, we no longer appeared to be dealing with science. Oh no, Mr Deputy Speaker, but rather the science. And to question the science was to risk being called and labelled a COVIDiot or that most poisonous of terms, anti-vaxxer. People who just wanted to query this new vaccine were closed down and were vilified. So I looked up the definition of anti-vaxxer and was surprised to learn that it is someone who opposes the use of some or all vaccines, regulations mandating vaccination, or usually both. And there were 246 of us in this house who, on the 13th of July 2021, voted against mandating the vaccines for care workers. That's 246 anti-vaxxers in this house, according to the latest definition. And that's absolute nonsense. People weren't anti-vaxxers. Other people have been now concerned that other vaccines families are losing faith in because of the way they were treated due to the COVID-19 vaccines. We've seen there has been a drop in the MMR vaccine. We've seen there has been a drop in the polio vaccine, which is wrong. People do need to take those vaccines. But all people in this house wanted to do was question this new vaccine, to have a debate on it, particularly when this House was wanting to mandate it on people and on care workers. So my point is this, if we allow language to be corrupted in this way and definitions of words to be bent out of shape, then we lack the tools for nuanced debate. And it is only by having a wide and open debate that we get to the central gravity of truth. I don't think we've had anything like a wide and open debate on the topic of the COVID-19 uh, COVID vaccines about their safety and their efficacy. And I come back to the word safe. Well, I just wanted to play that through because I know that uh, Esther McVeigh there really encapsulates a lot of the sentiments that we've been thinking about and um, really gives uh, words to our frustrations in, in that speech. Just before we finish today, I just want to read a, a short excerpt from the, um, this is from the appendix of a book called uh, 1984. It was expected that new speak would have finally superseded old speak or standard English, as we should call it, by about the year 2050. Now, this is actually quite concerning. Um, this is the sort of time frame that is quite feasible for the way things are going, foreseen by George Orwell in 1948, of course. Meanwhile, it gained ground steadily. That's Newspeak, gained ground steadily. All party members tending to use Newspeak words and grammatical constructions more and more in their everyday speech. Really is quite uncanny when you read some of these... Uh, well, predictions uh, from uh, the late, great George Orwell. So to George Orwell uh, and uh, Esther McVeigh, thank you very much and thank you for watching. You can run on for a long time, run on for a long time, run on for a long time. Sooner or later, God's going to cut you down. Sooner or later, God's going to cut you down. Go tell that globalist liar, that Democrat idiot writer, that rhino rambler, that nuclear war gambler, that backbiting U.S. politician. Sooner or later, God's going to cut you down. Sooner or later, God's going to cut you down.